Good morning, psych students. Hope you had a good Mother's Day weekend. Everybody's doing okay at home. This will be the uh, some of the final e-learning lessons for seniors coming up this week. Basic schedule is we got our last little bit of notes today on social psychology, positive social influence. So we're kind of the, we're at the bottom of the last page of the notes. And then uh, you'll have the Kahoot coming up tomorrow. And then you'll have all of Thursday and all of Friday to take the test, which I'll post on Microsoft Teams and okay, in a Microsoft Forms document. So, and the last week we talked about negative social influence and how sometimes the presence of others influences us not to behave and are not to be our best selves. You know, social loafing, less likely to help in a group. Group polarization, our opinions and attitudes become more extreme when we're with people who agree with us. Group think, uh, we swallow our tongues and go along with the group even when we know the group has a bad idea. De-individuation, loss of identity and, and, and responsibility in a group. You put on a mask and go around with a bunch of other masked kids and next thing you know, you're flipping cars over and setting them on fire. And bystander effect, that we're less likely to help when other people are around. So with that in mind, you're looking at the bottom of the page, positive social influence. I, and there aren't that many bullet points. I don't know why I put so many down there, but we're looking at counteracting the bystander effect. What are some factors? So if the idea of the bystander effect is, you know, everybody's watching Kitty Genovese get attacked in New York City in the 1960s and nobody helps or calls the police or tries to go intervene. Uh, what are some way? what are some factors that could influence whether we help or not? Okay. Or make us more likely to help. So looking at the bullet points, uh, presence of others, Okay, that would be your first factor. And what they've found in di different social psych experiments, that where people were actually hurt, but that we're more likely to help if we're by ourselves. Okay, because if you're by yourself, then, and you see, you know, I don't know, if you're alone in the hall, and you see Megan, and her stuff is on the ground, and maybe she's upset and crying. If you're by yourself, you might, you're more, you, you can't say, well, it's none of my business. Someone else will help her. She's fine. You're more likely to actually stop and help when you're by yourself or, you know, when when maybe there's only a couple other people around compared to a large group when, well, you know, it's kind of like on the interstate when you see a car pulled over the side of the road, you know, there are hundreds of cars. Somebody else could stop and help or, you know, you rationalize it to ourselves that way. You can't do that when it's just you and one other person. So presence of others. Mood plays a role. And this is something psychologists call the feel-good, do-good phenomenon. If you're in a bad mood, your attention tends to be on yourself. Yeah, you're thinking about, I don't know, why, why me? Why does this suck? Yeah, I, I don't, you're, you're concentrating on your own issues. In, a, in the feel-good, do-good phenomenon, because you feel good, because you're happy, you often want to spread that joy. You know, cheesy as that sounds, that's something that psychologists have noticed, that people who are in good moods are more likely to help other people. Number three, time plays a role. Yeah, I'll give you a, there was a famous experiment they did at Harvard Seminary School. So if you're in seminary, you're like my dad. You're studying to be a, a priest or a pastor. Uh, you've been, you know, my general impression of ministers is they, they are, for the most part, very good, caring people. And what they did in this experiment, though, is they went into a class and told one student or two students, hey, you've got a meeting across campus in five minutes. You've got to get there. Or you're going to get reprimanded. You're going to get in trouble. So they left their Bible study class. Okay, or looking at meaning of texts in the Old Testament, New Testament, including the story that they were reading of the Good Samaritan, which you know from your own Bible study or confirmation classes, if you've taken those, uh, is the story of a person who's beaten up and left to the side of the road and a bunch of people pass by the person and not help, and here comes the good Samaritan who eventually does. So that's on their mind. So anyway, they're rushing across campus to get to the meeting. The psychologist put a person kind of passed out on the sidewalk, lying right there, uh, who clearly needed help. The vast majority of these seminary students who remember had just been reading a story about helping somebody on the side of the road, okay, walked past. 
because they were in a hurry. Okay, time matters. You know, if you think to yourself, hey, I got time, I'm more likely to stop and help this person. But if you're in a rush, oh, I got to get to work, I got to get to class. You know, these are all factors that could influence a person being less likely to help. Okay, uh, level of competence. Okay, level of competence matters. So I'll give you an example. My mom was walking in Chicago one day and she tripped on the sidewalk and she had a nasty fall. And she had cuts and bruises and kind of a little bit stunned after the experience. She happened to fall outside some med students' homes. And all the she she described as she's kind of sitting there on the sidewalk days that all of the these kids, no, I mean kids to her, but there are people in their 20s studying to be doctors, come pouring out of the house eh, and you know help her up and treat her cuts and scratches and bruises. And they knew what they were doing. I would maybe call 911. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Or you think about this, you know, when you see somebody with a flat tire, do you know how to change a tire? If you do, and you've got the time combined with the other factor, you're more likely to help because you know how to help that person. If you don't know anything about cars, you don't know how to change a tire, you don't, you know, know how to start a jump start a battery, you're probably less likely to help in those situations. So your level of competence or expertise with the scenario also matters. How uh, they found the population matters. A people in small towns are more likely to help. Again, maybe it has to do with that that presence of others we talked about earlier. But you know, they they did an experiment. Actually, I think it was Zimbardo did an experiment in Palo Alto, which is where Stanford University is, which is a relatively small town, and New York City. And in New York City, he left a car there with the hood up on the street. And it kind of goes along with de-individuation. Within like three minutes, people started stripping the car for parts. Uh, in Palo Alto, did the same thing. The car just kind of sat there for a day. And then a guy came by and just shut the hood. And that was what happened. You know, smaller towns, people more likely to help other people than they are, say, in a city like Chicago, Los Angeles, things like that. And similarity matters. So similarity this would be the last bullet point on here. Uh, how similar are you to the person who's struggling or needs help okay, is going to affect whether the bystander effect occurs or not. So for me, let's say, for instance, as a father of two who's had situations where we've been at the store and a meltdown has happened, I'm probably going to have a lot of sympathy for parents, particularly dads, who might have a problem as their kids are screaming and crying. I'm definitely going to be like, oh, this dad doesn't know what they're talking about because I've been there. Maybe I help. Hey, can I help you get something off the shelf? Hey, or, you know, can I help your kids with something? More likely to help in those situations because I see myself in the victim. And that's the idea of similarity. If, if it's somebody who you can't empathize with because you've never been in a situation like that, you're less likely to help. Okay, so, you know, the idea of helping, and this is, you know, we're flipping to okay, uh, the last few things over here. Uh, we'll skip to term number three. Term number three is altruism. Okay, and so altruism is the selfless regard for the welfare of others. And psychologists are kind of fascinated by this concept. Selfless regard for the welfare of others. Uh, is there ever such a thing as a selfless act? A, uh, you know, where we just help people from the good of our hearts? Or do we always have selfish motives when it, when it comes to that? So a couple of things that they, they've studied and influence altruistic behavior. Uh, the social exchange theory is basically, if uh, I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. The idea that, you know, from my perspective, if I do a favor for you, maybe you'll do a favor for me sometime in the future. And that's the, the social exchange theory. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to help. Uh, all right, you know, I'll give you an example. I'm going to help my friend Dan with his AP bio homework, and he's going to help me with my calculus homework. Okay, tit for tat, even exchange of resources. Kind of goes along with the reward theory of attraction, actually. Uh, so that's the social exchange theory. The norm of reciprocity has to do with the, the other side of it. So social exchange theory is kind of from my perspective. I'm going to help you so that you will help me sometime in the future. 
and the norm of reciprocity is from your perspective. Now that I have helped you, you feel an obligation to return the favor, okay? Because the norm of reciprocity is that if someone does something nice for you, you feel obligated. There's that sense of obligation. You feel obligated to do something for them in the future. Okay, so because I, I don't know, I helped Keelan pick up uh, her books in the hallway when, when she got tripped, you know, she'll feel obligated to do the same thing for me if she sees me in the hallway struggling. Okay, that's the norm of reciprocity. And a lot of our relationships are based on that. You think of the, uh, the Office episode where Dwight tries to get everybody to owe him a favor and Andy doesn't let him because Andy keeps doing favors for him. It's kind of a combination. But again, try to differentiate. Social exchange theory has to do with your perspective on things. Dwight, I'm going to do a favor for these people so that they owe me a favor in the future. Andy feels the norm of reciprocity. I can't owe anyone a favor. If someone does something nice for me, I want to do something nice for them back. Okay, that's the norm of reciprocity. Final term on there, actually flipping up to term number two, social facilitation. And we're looking at positive social influence in the presence of others. Uh, social facilitation has to do to, with improved performance with others watching. So improved performance in the presence of others. Okay, we're more likely to perform better if other people are watching. And I, sports is probably the best example of that. You know, would you do better or worse with other people watching? And for a lot of people, they, they like to have a crowd there. Amps them up a little bit. Kind of goes along with what we talked about the last unit, the yerkes dodson arousal theory, uh, where, you know, if you're down here, hey, this isn't very good. You, you Nobody's watching, you're not properly aroused, and as a result, you don't do well. And then as more people show up and are cheering, increases arousal, your performance improves. That's what social facilitation. The opposite is social inhibition, because maybe there are some of you who would do better on a task if there weren't a lot of people watching. Maybe the pressure gets to you. But for the most part, psychologists have found that we, we do better when our aroused a little bit when we're amped up a little bit, our sympathetic nervous system is active and we, we perform to the best of our abilities in those situations. You're more likely to hit those free throws with someone watching than if nobody's watching. Okay, so that's social facilitation theory. So as I said, I'll post the Kahoot tomorrow and I'll post the test on Thursday. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll talk to you again soon.